IVF involves retrieving an optimal number of eggs needed to create enough healthy embryos so that at least one pregnancy is achieved. And for all of this to happen, your doctor determines how it's best done and creates a plan of action for you. So today on Lunchtime Live at the Center, Dr. Claudio Benediva, our medical director, is joining us to talk about the different protocols we use as well as or the different protocols we use as part of our IVF treatment plans and uh, including what they entail and what and why they're used. So Dr. Benediva, hello, good afternoon and welcome. Hi, I'm, hi good to see you. Thank you. What's a protocol in this? What does protocol even mean in the scope of IVF treatments? Yeah, well, that's a good question. So let me um, give you a little bit of background. Uh, like, why do we even need this kind of protocols? And uh, how long they've been around? So, <clears throat> you know, like you said, uh, we we use medications in IVF to stimulate the ovaries to produce multiple eggs. In a natural cycle, women will produce one egg. So we know for IVF, that's not enough. Uh, not every egg is gonna make a baby. So the more eggs we have to work with, uh, that the success of that cycle is gonna be better. So we use hormones to stimulate the ovaries so we can harvest multiple eggs. Now, when we stimulate the ovaries, the ovaries make more hormones. So the hormone levels are much higher than they are in a natural cycle. Mm -hmm. So your body doesn't know that you're being stimulated. So a lot of times, what happens if you do that is it will trigger the actually the brain will trigger ovulation before the eggs are ready before they are mature enough to be harvested. So that's a bad thing. So we for decades, you know, we use different medications that will prevent that from happening. It will stop your body from ovulating um, spontaneously before the eggs are ready. So we can decide when the eggs are ready to be harvested. And that's where the different protocols you know, come and there, there are so many different protocols for different types of patients. They all uh, pretty much contain the same parts. So one part is the stimulation drugs that will stimulate the ovaries. The second part is medications that will stop the brain from ovulating before the, the eggs are ready. So those are the suppression drugs. Uh, uh, for many years, it was really only one medication was Lupron. Mm. Okay, that's called a GnRH agonist, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's a medication that after a few days, it will start suppressing your own hormone production. It takes a few days. That's why, if we're using that, we need to start usually a week before the patient gets her period because it takes about a week to have the full you know suppression. Uh, and that's what's being called the long protocol. And a lot of, a lot of patients uh, and, and physicians know it as the long protocol. Why? Because it's a little longer. It starts the week before your period. You need to take okay. daily injections for several days. As opposed to the short protocol, which doesn't require as many injections, and that uses a different type of medication. They're called antagonists, GnRH antagonists. Those became available uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, uh, we were actually one of the earlier uh, clinics adopting these uh, new medications when they became available. I remember be, uh, speaking about it at the IVF World Congress in, in Argentina in 2002. So now it's like 19 years later. <laughs> By the time these were new medications and it had a lot of advantages less injections, they work fast. So the difference with the with the Lupron is that this uh, antagonist, and there are two. One is called Ganirelix, the, the other one is called Cetrorelix. They're made by two different uh, companies, but they both have very similar uh, effects. It's much rapid effect. So you, the patient doesn't need to start this a week earlier before her period starts. Actually, we can start a little bit later. So it requires less injections. And uh, that's the short uh, protocol. So that's a short protocol. And it's called short because there's less injections. Basically, you don't start a week before the patient starts her period. It starts on the sec typically the stimulation drugs start on the second day. OK. And then the medication to suppress the ovulation starts up after six days. So it only requires a few shots because these medications work faster. They don't need to have this 
slow, you know, suppression for several days. And for oh, the yeah, short well, protocol, well, um, what are the indications? Why would someone use that one? Right. So because of the advantages, less injections mainly, uh, we have pretty much um, um, utilized this short protocol for the majority of new patients. Uh, we use both, uh, you know, because the other one is a more traditional, uh, the long protocol is a more old fashioned traditional stimulation mm. that we still occasionally use. And it's very rare what we would use that for the first cycle. I think most new patients who have not tried any other protocols before, we will start with the short. Again, in general, if there are different scenarios, sometimes yeah. we may uh, adjust to each patient's needs, but I would say the majority, 90% of patients will use the short protocol, um, at least initially. Now, and that's called what, the antagonist protocol? That's the antagonist. Right. And what does antagonist mean in this? Well, antagonist is the, is the generic uh, type of drugs, but oh, they okay. do is they, they antagonize the receptor in the brain. So I told you that the purpose of the medications is to um, prevent ovulation from happening prematurely, right? So the antagonist actually block, they antagonize the receptor. So when when the the gland, the pituitary gland gets the signals, they're blocked. So it will not ovulate, basically. And so these are the so-called antagonists. But you know the 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 brand name of the medications is, is uh, like I said, Ganirelix or Cetrorelix. So that's the, the the name of the actual drug. They're generically called antagonists, GnRH antagonists. And then you so, have the long protocol, and that right. incorporates Lupron. Right. So they like so the the long protocol was the only one available before the early 2000s. So every patient was on the long protocol. Mm. Then we evolved to use the antagonist and the um, long protocol is is generally reserved for um, uh, patients that didn't do well or that we didn't uh, uh, have a good outcome with the short protocol and we want to change it. We want to try something different. So we will potentially in a subsequent cycle after we review what happened, mm. uh, uh, perhaps we wanted to try the long protocol to see if we can get better outcomes. Um, so I would say 90% of patients for their first IVF cycle most likely will have the short protocol. There is always some that could benefit from the long protocol and we, you know, we know who they are and uh, um, we will recommend that one versus the other. But uh, the advantages of the short protocol uh, with less injections, uh, it does have less risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome in addition to that. So it has a lot of advantages. That's why it's, for us, at least the preferred protocol for the majority of patients. But is there no, ever a reason to, <laughs> is there ever a reason for going straight to a long protocol? Uh, I think so. It's, it, like I said, less frequently. But for example, we may have patients that have done IVF in other clinics before. Okay. And in that case, we review their previous cycles. We find out what they use, how they did with that, and we may want to change them when we want to use the long protocol. Uh, there are some advantages with the long protocol that the short doesn't have. Mm -hmm. For example, the ability to schedule your cycle. With the short protocol, there is really very little ability to schedule uh, the cycle because we're depending on the um, when the patient starts her menstrual period. Got it. With the long protocol, because of the Lupron suppresses the hormones, we can really potentially start any time. Okay. So um, if there is a need, for example, for scheduling, for either personal reasons or, or, or um, other reasons, so we can uh, use the long protocol to help with that, uh, facilitate that. So uh, this long protocol requires more medications so, you know, is the additional investment worth it in terms of pregnancy outcomes? Uh, it really requires additional injections, mm -hmm. not so much additional medications because okay. Lupron is a vial that lasts for several days. Every day the patient takes a little bit out. So uh, it's really one vial of Lupron that will be most likely sufficient for the whole cycle. So there is no 
additional cost of medications is additional okay. injections because every day you have to take a little a little amount uh, so uh, and the answer is uh, yes if we think that for a number of reasons a patient can benefit from the long protocol uh, we we will use lupron in that case now do we as a practice create these protocols or is it standardized by a, a, a governing mm. body how where is this how are these created <laughs> No, no, it's not standard. It's not, but it's it's based on decades of uh, science and research. Okay. Uh, there are some protocols that are uh, standard enough that most clinics will do it the same way. There are uh, protocols that are uh, sometimes developed by uh, the clinic and okay. published. We have actually over the years published multiple papers on different protocols for different types of patients, the poor responders, the high responders. So we have really helped develop a lot of these protocols. And then by publishing and lecturing, other clinics sometimes uh, adopt them. And oh, they, okay. they, they read the results, they read the papers and the publications, uh, they hear our lectures and they will start trying it. So yeah, I think uh, we learn from each other. Got it. So uh, what percentage of patients are typically on this short and long because there are other protocols that, and are those used less frequently? I, I would say um, 80, 90% will okay. be on the short protocols, 10, 20% on the longer protocols. Okay. That's uh, approximately. And, you know, the other protocols are, are ones like fl the FLARE protocol, is that, or is that different from? FLARE is a protocol that uses Lupron. Um, Lup Lupron is a interesting drug. The first couple of days before it suppresses the hormone actually stimulates the, pro the, the hormone release. Mm. It's called the FLARE effect. Okay. Because it first releases and then, then it suppresses after a couple of days. So sometimes we want to take advantage of that initial flare effect. Those are the flare protocols. And there are different types of flare protocols. There is the microdose flare, where they use a very small amount of Lupron. Mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, the standard flare that uses a higher dose of Lupron. So uh, I would say, in general, those are protocols used for what we call poor responder patients, patients that don't make lots of eggs. Okay. So because these patients are challenging, there are many, many protocols that have been developed over the years to try to improve their response. So the flare protocols are, are one of the most popular ones for these patients, these poor responder patients. Okay. And there are uh, many other options and protocols for these uh, challenging patients that uh, we try. Sometimes if one doesn't work well, we try another one. Uh, so we do have a variety of protocols for those patients. Is it something that you determine for your patients or do you uh, speak with the other doctors on staff and come together with a different idea? Well, no, that's a great question. We have for years now, uh, every other week, a meeting called the Fail Cycle Review Meeting, mm -hmm. where we meet with all the doctors, our fellows, and the lab, the IVF embryology lab. Uh, and we review the either the difficult patients or the patients that have failed their, their cycle, and everybody um, shares their opinion. So um, we listen to the lab, and they obviously are big part of the IVF process. So we like to find out and hear from them about uh, the egg quality and the sperm quality and what the embryos look like. So we meet with the, with the lab and we all um, review the information and give suggestions and come up with a consensus for that particular patient. So that's, that's a very helpful meeting because yeah. our patients have the benefit not only of their doctor, wisdom and you know knowledge but the collective uh, wisdom i think from the entire clinic yeah that's it really shows 
how you guys work and and how As the patients team, are in yeah. good are in good hands there. All right, Dr. Kennedy, yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Um, it's interesting. I'm sure our patients really can um, benefit from this information for, and from this information. So thank you for sharing and uh, thanks thank you. My for pleasure. You're welcome. And my name again is Ami Chaksi and be sure to uh, check out our website at yukonfertility.com for additional information as well as a calendar, calendar of events. And we will see you next time on Lunchtime Live. It's Wednesday at 1230 next week. So take care. Thank you.